I should confess that I'm not a, a botanist or a plant scientist. I work mostly on, on mice. But for complicated reasons, which are no, not time to go into, um, I ended up sequencing quite a lot of plant genomes recently. So I want to talk to you about what we um, discovered as a consequence. So as you all, all know, Rabidopsis saliana um, has a fairly compact genome. It's 120 megabases, which coincidentally is about the same size as the uh, two other very important models, the, the worm and the fly. And uh, about 25 to 28 times smaller than the human and mouse genomes. Um, and this means on, on a Illumina HiSeq, which is currently the, the state of the art for, for sequencing for at least the next 10 minutes, we can sequence about 10 Rabidopsis genomes and about 10x coverage um, in one lane for a cost of under £2,000 in consumables. Um, of course, as you, you will know, modern sequencing machines produce fairly short fragments of DNA. Um, typically, read lengths are about 100 base pairs at the moment. Um, and so stitching them together to make a complete genome um, is still quite a challenge. So I want to talk to you a bit about how we um, go about doing this. Um, so the genomes that we were particularly interested in were 19 genomes, which are the progenitors of a population called MAGIC, which I'll talk about in more detail later. Um, but because these were the progenitors of this population, we really wanted to get the genomes assembled as accurately as possible. We didn't simply want to get a catalog of sequence variants. We really wanted to try to get the genomes contiguous so that we could then um, look at the gene structures in, in, in detail. And so I have I'm very lucky to have a very good postdoc, uh, Zhang Chao Gan, who came up with a, a kind of hybrid strategy for um, putting these genomes together. Um, so we have a very good reference genome, Columbia Zero. Nonetheless, we know that we, we expect to see about a SNP every 200 base pairs um, when you compare any uh, randomly chosen accession of Arabidopsis to, to the reference, um, plus a whole swathe of indels and structural variation. So we didn't want to rely simply on the reference genome as a template, but we obviously wanted to use that information um, where it helped us. So we came up with a kind of hybrid approach where we would... Um, align all the reads that we got from sequencing against the reference um, for each, ex each accession uh, set independently, um, where we were confident that a variant was correctly called, we would modify the reference genome accordingly, um, and then we'd realign the reads and repeat the process. Um, and after about five iterations, essentially, you've made as many uh, changes to the reference that, that, as you reliably can. Um, there, are, there are still a few places which you can't resolve. And then um, we, we reassembled all the, the, the reads uh, using a de novo assembler. So the de novo assembly is when you ignore the reference. You just try to stitch the reads together by overlaps. And as anyone who's done this will know, you end up with very, very small <laughs> contiguous regions. But nonetheless, this is a very good way of getting those, those parts of the genome which have diverged too much from the reference that you can't um, get them by read mapping or uh, where they are completely novel in sequence. So then you have to stitch together the de novo assembled pieces of the genome with the, um, the iterated references you've got. Um, and then you will need to compare that with some uh, test data to see whether you've actually improved matters. So this graph shows the progress uh, in terms of Accuracy. Um, so, as we go through this this stage, uh, this series of steps. So, um, I don't actually. Do I have a laser pointer? Yes, I do. So, on the y-axis, we have accuracy measured on a log scale. Um, so, this is errors per 10 kilobases. So, we kind of want to be down at about one error per 10 kb, which puts us, you know, at less less than one error per per gene type ballpark. Um, so these are the different iterations of the read mapping, and then these, these are the sort of two stages of integrating the, or rather three stages of, of de novo assembly, and then in integrating the um, assemblies together. These are four different test sets where we think we know the answer. Um, 
These two ones down here correspond to kind of vanilla single copy parts of the genome. One set is um, a set of one kilobase reads that Magnus Norberg sequenced some time ago, and the other is a 170 KB contig that some colleagues in New Zealand um, assembled. Um, and you can see that accuracy sort of comes down quite nicely, and you end up with uh, um, an accuracy of around one, one SNP error per, per 10 kb, which is what you'd like. These two other lines show you the behavior in more challenging parts of the genome. So this red line here uh, were fragments that Detlef Beagle sequenced, um, which were chosen as single copy, um, but very, very divergent from the reference genome. And you can see here that reference Alignment to the reference alone doesn't really get you down to where you want to be. It's only when you start to incorporate de novo assembled fragments that you end up in the right kind of place. This graph is for a 300 KB fragment, um, which contains about 50% transposon. So it's a sort of worst case um, part of the genome. And you can see here that we, we can get down to about 10 errors per, per 10 KB. Um, so, in other words, we do pretty well in the single copy parts of the genome. We don't do that well but in the repetitive regions, which is kind of what you'd expect. So, rather than simply sequence the genomes and, and leave it at that, um, we thought it would be more sensible to try to actually find out some biology um, about what these changes do. So, my, my colleague Richard Clark in Utah uh, produced um, RNA-seq uh, data from, from seedlings for, for each of the, the accessions. And my colleague Gunnar Rush, who was then in Tübingen and is now in New York, um, re-annotated the genomes. So he, he rebuilt all the gene models uh, essentially from scratch and then used the RNA-seq data to, to help in, in that pro process. So. I mean, this is a very interesting fact, which is if you simply apply the, the reference genome annotation, which is excellent, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not wrong. Um, if you apply it to each of these 19 genomes in turn, an astonishing third of the genes appear to be effectively you know, di severely disrupted or, or even non-functional um, in at least one of the, the 19 <coughs> genomes. But in fact, in 90, over 90% of these cases, the genes are actually functional. What has happened is a different gene model um, is, is, is in operation. Mostly this involves using an alternative splice site. Um, and this is an example here. Uh, Columbia and Landsberg have two different splice models. Um, and PO, which happened to be heterozygous, uh, this locus um, actually has both, has both uh, splice variants um, expressed. So, at first sight, this seems um, a very counterintuitive finding because you, how, if, you've, if, you've a, if you've got a mutation which knocks out a gene, um, you know, how are you then going get it, to get it back again? Um, it, it seems extremely unlikely. I think what actually happens in practice is that the different haplotypes um, that these accessories represent um, specialize in the expression of different splice variants. And then, essentially, you're free to accumulate what are effectively silent mutations on the unexpressed um, splice variant because it, you know, it, it, it doesn't have any cost. So I think that's what's happening. Um, we also looked at the, the ancestry of these sequences. Um, so of the 19 that we sequenced, uh, there were about 3 million variable positions in the genome, just over that, um, of which about 40% are private to one or to a, a, an accession. So if you do mass, it works out about 5% of the variants in any given accession are, are private to it within this, this, this set. Um, so of the remaining um, sort of 1.25 million SNPs, uh, which are put, which are uh, present in, in more than one accession, or have a minor allele frequency greater than one, um, we can then use those to construct the local ancestries as we go across the genome. Um, and the tremendous amount of recombination that has occurred in, in uh, Rabidopsis history means that 
the, the tree, the local tree which relates those accessions varies so rapidly across the genome that you have something like um, you know, 280,000 different trees um, at only 1.25 million sites. And moreover, if you ask how closely are any given pair of accessions related um, as you go across, across the genome, then it, and it, it kind of varies. So for some of the genome, a given pair will be the closest of the most closely related of the 19. You go somewhere else in the genome and they'll be the most distantly related. And this, this distribution of minimum clade size is, is a way of summarizing how, how closely related a given pair are. So each of these little gray lines represents um, a pair of the 19 accessions. So there are 19 times 18 over 2, whatever that is, pairs represented here. Um, the, the black is just the average of those and the green is what you'd get um, by chance. So, in other words, it, it, you simply can't apply a, a simple phylogeny to, to the ancestry of these sequences. It varies really rapidly across the genome. And it means that most of the variation is very ancient. It's, it predates the recombination, uh, which has been mixing things up. So, we also looked at uh, gene expression in, in, uh, as a quantitative trait in these, in these 19 genomes. Um, and though we didn't have very much power, um, for, some, for about 800 genes, we could map um, sequence variants which affected uh, quantitative variation in gene expression. So this is a kind of... Uh, this is a distribution of where the most strongly associated sequence variant is relative to the start of, of the gene. And you can see there's a large peak there, uh, right at the start of transcription, which is what you'd expect. This sort of shows the same data in a, in a cartoon form, where we have a kind of typical gene represented um, by these different blocks. So this is the start of transcription, exon 1, intron 1, so forth. And here we're just counting the frequency at which the most strongly associated sequence variant, um, where, where, uh, which block we'll put it in. And you can see you get a very nice concentration right at the start of transcription. So in other words, we're fairly confident we are sometimes mapping the, identifying the true causal variants here. So, so we not only have a near complete catalog of variation for these accessions, we, um, we have the gene models, so then we can, we can actually work out which sequence variants are probably having a causal effect on, on, on transcription. Um, we can also do the same with other types of variation in, in, in the gene models. We can look at um, splice variation, and a, here is a particularly simple uh, form of uh, splice variation where an intron is, is retained. This, this is one, one particular gene. I can't remember which one it is. These are, the, uh, these are the accessions that we sequenced which um, essentially have no sequence coverage in this intron. So this is, this is the intron, this is the, these are the two flanking exons. And these accessions um, do have some, some uh, coverage. Okay, so each, each red line represents the coverage for one of these exons, or sorry, one of these accessions or one of, one of these guys. So you can quantify um, intron retention, and then you can try to map it in just the same way. And again, we, what we find is that we can map the most strongly associated sequence variant does lie either, either within the intron or very close to it. So we're, we're primarily interested, or we, we chose these, these genomes to sequence um, because they're the progenitors of a population called magic. So, I want to talk first of all about the difference between sort of synthetic and natural populations. Um, and it's really a trade-off between uh, recombination, how much recombination is in the population, which is good in terms of being able to map down to the causal genes, um, and the power to detect uh, uh, <coughs> quantitative trait loci. And that's really related to the, the minor little frequency of the um, of the variant, and so there really there are kind of two classes. There are what we call synthetic populations, where we we've done the crossing, 
and then there are natural populations where we just go out in the wild and see what there is. So the simplest populations are F2 crosses or black crosses uh, where you have very high uh, minor little frequency. You have tremendous power, but you have virtually no mapping resolution. You, you, know, you can map things down to you know, a third of a chromosome in, in mice. Um, then there are various... Uh, designs which increase the, the amount of recombination and the amount of allelic diversity, um, and the magic population belongs in about here. And then there are sort of outbreds which are descended from inbred strains. Uh, commercial mice are an example. I can't think of a plant example, but that's probably due to my ignorance. Um, then over here we have the natural populations. Um, as, as you may well know, um, there's a large effort underway, but essentially completed now to sequence um, a thousand uh, Rabidopsis successions, um, and there are similar efforts in, in human and, and mice. Now these have a lot of recombination, they have a lot of uh, mapping, very high mapping resolution, but they have lots of problems in terms of population structure and lots and lots of rare variants. Um, and if a variant occurs at a very low frequency in the population, it's very hard to, to map. So you can think of the synthetic populations as a way of starting off with a bunch of inbred founders, crossing them, so the genomes become these mosaics, chopping them up a bit more, and then possibly inbreeding to make recombinant inbred lines. Um, and so the population we were particularly interested in is, is MAGIC, which was started by Paul Lakova. Um, so all this work was funded by two BBSRC grants. So the 19 founders for the magic lines are, are kind of worldwide representatives of, of Arabidopsis. Um, we didn't know at the time, but we know now that the variation segregating in these, um, in these 19 um, is, probably represents about 60 to 70 percent of that of the com more common variation segregating in the, all the genomes which have been sequenced since then. So it, it's a reasonably good um, snapshot of, of what, what variation is out there, at least of the common variation. Um, so Paula crossed, so she made, each magic line has been made from a kind of 16-way, what's called a funnel design. So though there are 19 founders, um, the number of progenitors for a given line is statistically less than, than that uh, because of the way the, the crossing works. Um, but you end up with genomes which are basically uh, random mosaics of, of, of the founders. And so we initially, um, before we could sequence Rabidopsis genomes at the drop of a hat, uh, we, we genotyped these, these lines with 1,200 SNPs. And this shows uh, a typical mosaic structure represented here as um, the output from a hidden Markov model. So you can't see it here, but these are the 19 founders. These are the five chromosomes for Rabidopsis. The sh shades of gray you could just make out are the kind of posterior probability of being descended from each of the 19, given the genotype data. And then the red lines are our kind of best guess. This is essentially a hidden Markov model um, threaded through the data. Um, and down here, the black line shows the, the posterior probability of coming from whichever line we, we designated as being um, uh, the most, most likely. So most of the time, you have very high certainty. It tends to drop down near the um, chromosome boundaries. And also, although I haven't shown it, it drops down um, near, near, near the, the centromeres. Um, there are some places here which are probably still heterozygous. So, um, which is kind of indicated by places where, where the, gr the green is very different from the, from the black. OK, so that all looked fine. Um, uh, but more recently, we were in a position to, to revisit the, the magic genomes by, by resequencing them, um, effectively using sequencing as a way of doing genotyping. And there are kind of two approaches to this. Um, there's one which I won't talk about, but, but is perfectly respectable, which is to sequence the same bits of the genome by either restriction digest or, or by RNA-seq. Um, so this is effectively the same as 
SNP chip in the sense that you're only going to see certain bits of the genome, but those bits you do see, you're going to get a lot of data on. Um, the alternative is to sequence genomes at very low coverage, typically less than one one-fold coverage, um, and then look across the population as a whole to make sense of the data. Okay. Um, the advantage of this is it's you know it's a very simple process. You don't have to go through um, all, all the other steps. Um, so there have been a number of papers now in, in, in Rice, um, uh, for example, using this this approach. And so we've done this in in the map, well at least on some of the magic lines, and about 500 of them so far. Um, and so. This represents the mosaic of one of the lines. Um, now, I should explain, those look superficially like the graphs you plots you saw earlier. Um, it has a slightly different interpretation. The y-axis um, is essentially the probability, uh, or it's rather the, the error rate. Um, if you make the assumption that this region of the genome is zoo zero, then all the sequence fragments that um, align in this region should, any sequence variance should match um, the polymorphisms we know from, from zoo zero. And, and this essentially gives the, the uh, accuracy, or rather the negative log 10 of the, the error rate. So four or five is kind of where you would expect to be. Um. And so we're sequencing these at about, well, 0.5x coverage. We end up with something like 500,000 reliable SNP calls per genome. The crucial thing is you have to see, you have to filter on stuff that you know is segregating. Okay, if you don't do that, you have a huge number of false positive um, SNP calls, and the method doesn't work at all. But with those si simple filters, um, this turns out to be a very, very simple, very reliable way of um, getting these mosaics. And this means that we can map these breakpoints um, very accurately. And this is a bit of a diversion, but the, surprisingly enough, this type of approach works quite well with um, dip, uh, diploid heterozygous genomes. And uh, it's quite surprising because it means you only have, typically have one read covering any bit of the genome, if that. And so you'll only ever see one allele. Um, but nonetheless, because you'll be sampling from both chromosomes as you go along, sort of more or less evenly, um, you can still reconstruct diploid genomes um, with remarkable accuracy at quite low coverage. So this is a simulation for, for mouse. Um, this is different levels of coverage. This is the error rate. Um, and you'd like to be around sort of 1% error rate. And this is for different um, kind of average block sizes. So when you've chopped the genome up, depending on the, mate, on the breeding scheme, you're going to end up with uh, blocks of some average characteristic size, and so the bigger the block, the lower the coverage you need, which is kind of what you'd expect. Um, but say for, uh, for the kind of mouse populations we're working with, um, around 0.1x coverage is probably sufficient for our purposes. Um, we have a big project in humans at the moment where we're sequencing, well, the BGI, I should say, is sequencing 12,000 human genomes for us at 1x coverage, um, which is quite exciting. So one of the things that we found from this, though, which was really unexpected, uh, was that we would find these strange clusters of breakpoints, well, well, or rather predicted breakpoints. Um, so here's a small cluster. Here's, here's a large one. Um, and we were kind of scratching our heads a bit over this. Um, um, so one thing we, we were worried about was, well, maybe this is just an artifact. Um, uh, the, the, the algorithm which is used to sort of decide where to put breakpoints in um, has a penalty associated with it. So you can, you can vary that penalty and you can try and see um, whether you can get rid of the breakpoints. And well, you can to some extent, but they, after a while, you still get some which, which stay, and there's quite a lot of them. Um, and so the question is, is what's going on here? Um, well, one, one interpretation, which would be the sort of uh, exciting one, would be that these represent recombination hotspots um, from a, the accumulation of about 10 generations of, of breeding. This might be just an artifact due to the um, 
misalignment of reads, um, or it could be some, some problem with that algorithm. Um, or maybe uh, some signature of genome rearrangements. Um, so we don't know for sure what the answer is, but we, we, th we think at least many of these uh, breakpoints probably are genuine. Um, certainly, if you, if you compare the number of breakpoints you see from the SNP genotype data to the sequencing, you get a, a rough correlation. But if you look, the scale of this axis is uh, rather bigger than this one. So you're seeing more breakpoints, but they are concordant. Um, <clears throat> if you try to impute back the original SNP genotypes um, using the sequence data, we, we, we get them with very high accuracy. So, so we, we know we're sequencing the same, same material. Um, if we look whereabouts in the genome these clusters of breakpoints occur, then it varies from chromosome to chromosome. In chromosome 5, they're nearly all clustered in one place. Chromosome 1 and 2 are a bit more diverse. Um, We've also gone back and resequenced um, 10 of the lines which had very, very high uh, clusters of breakpoints, um, a very high, a much higher coverage of 15x. So uh, that coverage, we can essentially see whether there's anything anomalous around the breakpoints. Um, and I'd say that we're, we are, you know, the, these data confirm somewhere around a half to 80% of of breakpoints as, as looking okay. I mean, we can't see anything obviously wrong with them. Um, I, mean, I think this is quite exciting. There have been a number of papers being published in other species showing, uh, say, for in, ca in cancer genomes, you get sudden fracturing of genomes and, re and massive rearrangements. I don't know whether this, this will stand up, but it looks, it looks like we could be observing a similar kind of um, phenomenon here. So the last thing I want to talk about briefly is the application of all this to QTL mapping, which is really why I got involved in this, in this project. Um, so because the magic lines are, are this synthetic population descended from 19 genomes, um, they have a, a peculiar genetic architecture, which is very different from what you will see where you just take a large number of accessions and sequence them and then do association mapping. You won't see ultra-rare variants. You shouldn't see anything with a, a minor allele frequency much less than 1 in 19, which is about 4.5%. Um, the maximum sort of haplotype space is known. It only, it, only, it only lock us. There should only be 19 different haplotypes, sometimes much less. Um, and this means that you can, you can um, test for association, really, at a variety of levels. So the simplest thing is to... Uh, just allow every one of the 19 different haplotypes to have a different phenotypic effect, fit a model like that, which we call a haplotype model. Or you can kind of collapse everything down at a given sequence variant. That, that effectively is merging those 19 founders into a number of groups. If it's a simple SNP, it's just two groups of accessions where the, the hypothesis would be if that variant is the causal variant, then... Um, there's only kind of two, two different phenotypic values you can take. Um, or something in between, if it's some, some sort of hybrid, some, uh, something which is less than the full 19, but uh, more, more than, than the two. So we can ask which of these models seems to look, uh, represent the data better. So this is an example. This is um, salt concentration, or Na sodium concentration in the magic lines. This is, um, I forget which chromosome this is, I do apologize. Um, this, this, this trait has a stonkingly huge QTL. This is a log P of, uh, what's it, 60 odd, so 10 to the minus 60. I mean, yeah. Very easy to, very easy to map. Am I running out of time? Okay. Um, blue line is the sort of haplotype test as you go across this region. Um, each of these dots represents one, one sequence variant which has been t tested. And you can see some dots sort of lie above this pale blue line. Majority are down here. I haven't plotted them, but there's a massive sludge of stuff down here. So you can see that you, what you get are a small number of variants, but they can be scattered over um, a, wide, a wide range. Um, 
And if you look in more detail, the, the highest peak corresponds to HK, or contains HKT1, which is probably the causal gene here. I'll skip over the next thing. Simulations indicate that if we have just a single sequence variant, causal variant, then um, we have a high chance of being right on the money. Um, so this is the error, this is the distance from, of the true sequence variant from the one that we would call as being most highly associated uh, at different minor allele frequencies. And so there's a high probability that you, you get exactly the right variant. There's also quite a high probability you're a long way off. So you have a kind of uh, bimodal behavior there. So um, what have we learned from all this? Uh, well, one is that you should be quite careful about applying the reference genome to different accessions of Arabidopsis, and I think this is going to be true more generally. Um, you really do have to think about reannotating genomes. We are seeing all sorts of interesting um, recombination behavior. We don't quite know what's going on there, but it looks very interesting. Um, I didn't really have a chance to talk too much about this, but it, it looks like the architecture of complex traits is complex when you get right down to the sequence variants. Um, I'm going to have to, I can't really go into that now, but um, it, it, I think it's really, it's really going to be the case that you get a single causal SNP. I think it's going to be, it, the data we're, we're seeing looks more, more, a bit more complex than that. Um, so I'll stop there except to thank um, people who did all this work. BBSRC and the NSF and the Max Planck Institute funded it. Um, these are the people who did all the work. The sequencing was done at the Wellcome Trust Centre in, in Oxford.